So, the next claim So, B prime, this is linearly independent. Once again, when we map something to 0, it is very important that you understand what 0 are we talking about. The 0 of which vector space? This is the 0 of the vector space of linear functionals. In other words, to show that summation alpha i f i is equal to 0 v, yeah? implies alpha i is equal to 0 for all i. That is what the linear independence condition boils down to. Yeah, of course, every field must have the 1 and the 0, right? No, so, so it's one and zero from, from yeah, yeah, it is 1 and 0 of the field because it is get, getting mapped. Yeah, it, If it is all zeros, then it is un, unimportant, like it is the boring case when it is a 0 functional. Right? Okay. So, what are we saying here? We are saying that, uh, okay. Yeah. So, this 0 of the V prime, yeah. So, this 0 of the V prime means that every object, this means that summation alpha i. F i, of course, i going from 1 through n, i going from 1 through n, this v is equal to 0. Where is the 0 of? Is the 0 of the field now, because I have passed on the argument now. So, this is not in the sense of the functional anymore. So, this is the 0 of the field for every v belonging to vector space V and that is the most important observation. That is, it's, it has to be true for every V. If it is true for every V, I can go ahead and choose some very special Vs and conclude certain things about this. Yeah. So, choose V is equal to V1, say for instance. Then what do I immediately have? This means, that alpha 1, f 1, v 1, is there anything else really to it? Because when you take f terms f 2 onwards, f 2 acting on v 1 is what? 0. So, it contains no other term. So, the only thing is this. But what is f 1, v 1? That is 1. So, this means that alpha 1 is equal to 0. But is really 1 any special or any more special than any of the other numbers from 1 through n? So, I can just, you know, choose this i, maybe I will take the shortcut while I expect you to repeat this with other values, but I will just take this for any i, yeah. So, any i you choose, you are led to eventually concluding that alpha i must be 0. So, this means that alpha i is equal to 0 for all i which is exactly what I wanted to show. So, therefore, you have a linearly independent set, you have a generating set. Therefore, by virtue of those two claims, the big result is, that is why I have not erased that part, this B prime is a basis for V prime, not just that, you will see that we call it B prime is a dual basis to B. So, given any basis in the original vector space V, I have a corresponding dual basis by virtue of this Kronecker delta thingy here, right. I will just work out a very simple example in R3. So, this is clear, right? This idea is clear? The fact that it is a generating set and a linearly independent set and therefore a basis for the dual space. What is it that immediately strikes out? 
the dimensions of v and v prime must be equal therefore they are isomorphic right but uh, maybe not in today's lecture but in the next lecture we shall see that there is something very interesting in order to show that these two are isomorphic you had to actually construct basis right so it is said that there are levels of proof that involve constructions of basis and then there's a higher level of proof which does not go through this basis construction so it's like you know it's a good time to read george orwell by the way so there's this orwellian line that all animals are equal but some are more equal than others right so you have vector spaces that are isomorphic but some vector spaces are more isomorphic than others and it turns out that there are objects such as double duals so you have the vector space v you have the vector space v prime which is a dual to v and then you have a vector space v double prime which is a dual to v prime and it turns out that v double prime is also isomorphic to both of these aforesaid spaces but in order to show the isomorphism between v and v double prime that is a double dual you don't need to go through any construction of basis they are what we call as natural isomorphisms so isomorphic vector spaces are of course equals in some sense but in order to prove the uh, isomorphism between v and v prime we had to go through this route of constructing an explicit basis for the second vector space in terms of the first there is this dual b prime as a dual to b when in the next lecture we return and show you that the double prime or the double dual is actually also isomorphic to v we will not require the choice of any basis it will be a natural isomorphism in some way it might appear a little mystifying at this point but we shall see that they are actually more equal than this first and not just that if you just expand your thought a little bit you will see that this double so the double prime then the fourth prime then the sixth prime and all these happen to be more naturally isomorphic and the first dual the third dual the fifth dual onwards they also happen to be naturally isomorphic i mean it's like some shadow spaces that are happening right they are isomorphisms so all of them you keep taking duals they keep becoming isomorphic to one another but the the one hop the skip if you like first uh, to the third or the v to the double dual they happen to be more naturally isomorphic we will see that proof in the next lecture but today we shall continue with this and see something interesting as well uh, so what is it that we have seen that there is a double there is a dual basis to every basis that we can cook up in the original vector space v so let's take the simplest example one can think of so let's suppose v is equal to r3 and let's say b just to illustrate the idea b is equal to say 1 0 0 uh minus 1 1 0 and 1 minus 1 minus 1 i leave it to you to check that this is indeed a linearly independent set the cardinality is 3 so it's indeed a basis right so check to see that b is a basis for r3 so by the way what do you think a dual to r3 would look like any guesses what sort of objects will take will ingest objects like these and spit out a member in the field that is a real number sorry so if you take this as column vector i put it to you that you take this yeah as r3 row vectors that's all that's going on all this while we've been talking about this dual but if you view it in terms of coordinates it's really nothing but the action of some row vector on these column vectors that will spit out a scalar in the field right so now just to explicitly so of course i'm assuming that you will check and convince yourself that this is indeed a legitimate basis for r3 and once we have the fact that this is the dual space the row vectors is what we are looking for any questions here here okay so now all that we need to construct is the basis for those row vectors there's a vector space of row vectors three tuples 
right? So what do we need? We need, firstly, an object which when we take multiplication with this, spits out a 1. But with any of these other fellows, it must spit out 0. Remember, it's a Kronecker delta, right? So what must it have over here? See, first of all, with this and this, it must be 0. So if I am looking for the first object here, uh, let's say B prime, if I'm looking at the first object here, my first observation is that the first two entries must be equals, shouldn't they? Otherwise, this cannot vanish. See, when this object, this is F1, acting on V2 must be 0. Right? So therefore, the first two objects must be identical. Right? What about this? The third object, maybe I can just put the third object as 0. It matters not. But the first two objects, what should I put? Just 1 and 1. Check. This times this is just 1. This times this is 0. And this times this is also 0. Right? What about the second object, F2? I need something that takes this and makes it 0. Yeah? But I need to have 1 here. So what should I do? And I need to have 0 here again. So this object, I need to make it 0. And these two objects are somehow also badgering me a bit. So what should I choose? Sorry? 0, 1, minus 1. Exactly. Right? So you take, for instance, this 0. This picks out this. And this filters out these two, but their difference is 0. What about the third? So this is actually the dual basis that I'm constructing here. Now you can think of arbitrary abstract vector spaces and you proceed in a similar manner and you should be able to construct duals. If there's a problem, just go ahead and go to their coordinate representations. That will be simple enough, right? Because we've taught you that finite dimensional vector spaces, take them to their basic coordinate representations and that's all that you need to understand them. So what is this? Just to complete, complete the story. 0, 0, minus 1, yeah. So this is indeed the dual basis to this. Yeah, what we've just learned. Any questions on this so far? This, this is just the example. Right? Okay. Now, let us look at the following situation. V, finite dimensional vector space, over F, B, is equal to V1, V2, Vn is a basis for V. Suppose W, yeah, I mean I could have started the other way around. I could have started with a W, taken a basis for W and expanded it for a, to a basis for V. It doesn't matter. You, you get the idea. Suppose W which is a subspace of V and subspace given by W, it is span of say V1, V2 till Vk, right, of course k is less than or equal to n, right? So w is of course a subspace sitting inside v. Hmm? Now we will define a new object w with superscript 0, yeah? is defined in the following manner, f belonging to v prime such that f of w is equal to 0 for all w belonging to w. 
So this is called the annihilator of the subspace W. Okay. Why? Because every time you feed it some object from W, yeah, every time you feed it some object from W, it just takes it to 0. Nothing much to read to into it except for the definition as of now. But now the first non-trivial claim that shall be made is that this object, this annihilator is a vector space of course over f. So let me write that in brackets lest it create confusion. <clears throat> okay. How do we show it is a vector space? Well you take any two objects f1 and f2 I will just do a very sketchy proof of this alpha f1 plus f2. Right? If this object were to act on some object picked from W, then what should it be? Because of the linearity, we can write this as alpha f1 acting on that object plus f2 acting on that object, but each of them individually is a 0. So therefore, this is indeed the 0 of the field and we are done. Right? So the annihilator is indeed a vector space. Right? Yeah. But the more interesting claim is that So, if your original vector space W, which is a subspace of V, is spanned by the first k fellows out of this n in the original basis, then go ahead, look at the dual basis, all right. So, maybe I should uh, say that V prime is equal to span of F1 till Fn. where f i v j is equal to delta i j like before. So now if the first k fellows out of this n are a spanning set or a generating set of course they are linearly independent any subset of a linearly independent set is linearly independent we prove that. So if this is a basis for w then the last n minus k fellows of this dual basis is a basis for the annihilator. If this is true, if this is true, what can we say about the dimensions of W and its annihilator? Yeah, the dimension of W. So if this is true, the consequence is, the consequence is that the dimension of W plus the dimension of its annihilator is equal to the dimension of V. And that is precisely, I urge you to think about this on a, for a moment, nothing but the rank nullity theorem. Just think of it in terms of matrices or other things and you will be able to precisely see what I, what I mean by that. But the point is that we have to show that this is a basis. Is linear independence under question? Of course not, because this is a subset of a basis. So it must be linearly independent. The only thing that I need is to show first that this is contained inside span of uh, f k plus 1 till f n and 
the fact that this span of f k sorry f k plus 1 till f n is also contained inside the annihilator. That is the two things we shall prove in order to establish that there is a basis for w naught or the annihilator of w right. So, we will do a detailed uh, write up of this, but I will just give you the idea of how and why this carries forward maybe that will help you grasp the proof better in the next lecture. So, what do we have to do in order to prove that something is spanned by this? You take what is the defining property of objects inside this? You take any typical fellow sitting inside the annihilator of w, it means that that linear functional must pulverize every object inside w. So, when that linear functional acts on fellows which are linear combinations of the first k fellows here, it must map it to 0. But look, after all every object that is every object that is sitting inside this w naught is coming from where? It is coming from v prime remember, v prime just like w is coming from v, w naught the annihilator is coming from v prime. So, in general an object inside v prime has some special properties and then it belongs to w annihilator. So, any object inside v prime is a linear combination of objects inside this set. Now, if you pass on the special fellows that are residing inside w, then they must be pulverized, right. So, if you pass on very special fellows like this v1, v2, v3, what do you immediately see? If you pass on v1 to a linear combination of these fellows, right, or the other way around, if you pass on v1 to a linear combination of, uh, where, where is it, the f's, yeah, these fellows. What do you immediately conclude? That the coefficient of f1 must be 0. The others are anyway zeros, but alpha times f1 v1 must be 0. Otherwise, it cannot be an annihilator, right. Similarly, for f2 v2, therefore, the coefficient of f2 must be 0. So, when you are saying that any object in v prime, for it to also be an object inside w0, the first k coefficients of these f's must all vanish. And therefore, the only non-trivial coefficients that you will be left with are those of the last n minus k. So, therefore, this is indeed something that is spanned by or generated by these fellows. And now, it is only trivial to show that if there is any object that is spanned by this and you feed any object from w to these fellows, all of them identically vanish because it cannot contain components from v k plus 1 onwards. Any object that is sitting inside w is a linear combination of objects from v1 through v k. So, when any of those objects from v1 through vk, this is the indicator function as your friend rightly said. So, when this indicator tries to check for objects from v1 through vk, they do not light up. They are all zeros anyway. So, this is also contained inside this. We will write this in more formal terms, do not worry about it. But the point is that we will show that this is contained inside this, this is also contained inside this and therefore, they are nothing but equal. So, therefore, the dimension of the annihilator given that the dimension of the subspace is n minus k is going to be n minus k where n is the dimension of the vector space. Now, you think about which is the image and which is the kernel and so on and so forth, but I put it to you that this as a consequence of what we shall prove next day is another statement of the rank nullity theorem. Just put some thought behind this, okay. That is the important concept to take home from this. Thank you.